Uh, here in Geneva, many of you have devoted considerable effort to finding common ground on agriculture and food security, among uh, many other issues around agriculture. Uh, and it's central to the negotiations, we all know that. Uh, but uh, in many respects, on terms that were set more than a decade ago. So r regardless of whether some of the evolving issues uh, will be able to be addressed, uh, some of these new dynamics will be able to be addressed at the WTO, uh, they will in any case be affected by the new dynamics. So today we're going to hear about how uh, some of the changes are evolving in the agricultural markets. Uh, and uh, over the last few years, the idea of a new normal, is that new normal uh, still a new normal, or is it, uh, do, we, do we understand more about it than we did? Uh, uh, so in order to get a grip on some of the potential implications for these changes, ICTSD has done um, considerable work. We did the uh, e-book, which many of you have seen, uh, which is obviously preferred in its um, physical form to its e-form. Uh, so it always feels funny to call it an e-book and then show you the copy of it. But people, people like the physical copy, uh, but it's available. Uh, and uh, some, some of what we're doing today draws directly on, on work that was presented in this book uh, and from people who have uh, considerable experience in this area. So we asked our presenters to update us on their analysis, what's new and what's changed. Do we, do we have any more dimension on the realities in agricultural markets now? Are we going a different direction? Do we understand more about the, about the interactions? Uh, we're doing, in, in, as it were, a bit of a reality check. Uh, so we're also joined by two uh, excellent discussants um, who are going to bring, uh, bring unique perspectives, I think, and help situate uh, what we hear from our experts uh, into contexts that are uh, relevant for all of us. Um, the, the panelists and commentators were asked to share their insights, and we'll get, we're going to hear, I think we're going to hear an, uh, a great diversity of views, but um, we, we don't think that this is probably going to encompass all of the views on the topics that we're going to discuss. So we welcome um, your input in the discussion. Um, I, for me, uh, as, as I've been working on this, and I think for our program, which has been going for quite some time, the, the meeting is in some ways as much about ensuring that we ask the right questions as finding the right answers. And our panelists will have some ideas for answers, uh, but it's very clear to me that getting the questions right uh, is equally, if um, not more challenging, and then finding the answers from there, uh, another matter. So on, on process, uh, so we have rather little time. We only have a couple of hours. Uh, and uh, I know we have people who have a lot to say. Uh, so on process, what I'd like to do is go through, uh, through our panelists' presentations, uh, one after the other, please, and uh, our commentators as well and then come back out for some discussion. I'm, I'm, I'm aware that you're going to have to sit for a little while, uh, so I hope, that's, uh, I hope that's going to be okay, but I think that's going to allow us to then have some open discussion afterwards with quite a lot of material on the table. Um, you should also know that we are webcasting this event. Uh, our objective, and we've had incredibly good success with this, is uh, to really reach out and ensure not only that you in Geneva are able to have this kind of conversation, but that people from all over the world are able to access it as well. Uh, so we're very happy to do that. In fact, our, uh, our first presenter, Seth Meyer, is going to be presenting from the United States. Uh, so we're going to be getting him virtually. Um, and I'm hoping, Seth, that you'll be able to stay with us and when we go to the Q&A, uh, be able to uh, be able to interact as well. So we'll we'll see how that works. Um, I'm now going to go through the um, through the bios, uh, and I, I hope that's also all right. Um, the the people that we have are, have fantastic reputations as it is. The bios are in your packages. They're on the website. 
Uh, and so I think we should get right to the substance, and I will stop there. Uh, so if I can ask uh, Seth to lead off, uh, and, uh, and I look forward to hearing what you have to say, Seth. Thank you for joining us. All right. No, thank you for having me. Um, I, if you'll indulge me just a bit, I think it's, uh, uh, in terms of a bio, just as an explanation when I go through my presentation, um, over the last three years, I've gone from looking at markets over 10 years to looking at markets over 40 years, and for the last several months now, my job requires me to look at basically 18 months in the market at a time. So you'll notice I, I bounce around a little bit in this presentation. I only have a, few, a handful of slides, but I've thought about this over a number of, of different periods when examining the topic. Okay. When we think about stocks, uh, you know, this, this discussion began for me uh, a couple years ago with this group, and you know we were at a period of time where we had universally tight stocks for grains and oil seeds. Um, we've seen very good crops around the world after the drought of 2012 in the United States, so we're in a period of rebuilding stocks. Um, I put 2000 to 2003 in the first column as a reference for you because this is a period when um, we had low prices. We were coming out of a period of low prices and, and stock levels had been rather burdensome. So you can see that for the most part, we are not back to those very high stock levels. And in some cases, um, we're getting a little, say, uh, perhaps a little bit tight in the world rice market. Um, soybeans is a bit deceptive because stocks are measured at a particular time of the year and with the growth in the South American crop, it makes it appear as if we have large stock levels at any given time, simply because we now have about an even split between North and South Southern Hemisphere stocks. The point being that we've begun to rebuild stocks. Um, we've had a couple decent years, price levels have moderated, and but yet we are not at the the burdensome stock levels of the late 90s and the early 2000s. Along with those higher stock levels, you'll see that we've also seen prices moderate significantly across the board for all these primary commodities. And, and you'll forgive me if I'm a bit uh, US focused in terms of prices on a few things, um, but you'll notice that we set some record for these records for these commodity prices in the last couple years, and we've come down significantly. Again, not to the levels we saw in the early 2000s, but significant drops that are putting pressure on at least U.S. producers, and I know in producers in the rest of the world, in terms of net returns for these crops, given the rise in input costs that they also saw as commodity prices were rising. So we've seen commodity prices moderate. We're not back down to the burdensome level, but we certainly are cutting the incentives for further ex uh, production expenses. And we'll see, uh, we've invited a lot of competition with those high prices around the world, and we'll see if those crops stay in production. Now, I know you'll see more of this discussion in the future, but you know what we as USDA have seen is basically a flattening of, of nominal prices or, or modestly declining real prices. And this is a continuation of a trend that's been going on for years and years. And when you put things in, in this context, the jump we saw in real prices, not large, but unusual, and a, and a flattening of real prices going forward. Okay. But global gr uh, growth in trade is expected to continue. We see an expectation for glowing, growing global trade and, and in soybeans and soybean products in particular, uh, both coarse grains and wheat continue to grow in terms of trade, but soybean and soybean products and one country in particular, China, is really driving that growth expectations in trade. However, when we talk about our expectations of are we in a new normal, we, we've seen uh, strong demand um, over the last several years Big crops, record crops for wheat, record crops for corn, record crops for soybeans around the world. At the same time, we've had very strong demand. And when we think about the risks which could push prices lower, which could, uh, you know, 
are, are we in a situation of lower commodity prices and a return to lower commodity prices? One of the things we look at is how optimistic are we about demand in several areas? And we're probably a bit more pessimistic in some of the key driver areas than we've been in the past, including China, in terms of, of China's demand for our agricultural commodities. And this, others will talk more about energy and about the ability of the energy market to absorb commodities at lower prices. But I think there's an important question in, in terms of are we in a situation where we expect prices to go lower and what are the implications if we, if, if we do. Now, having said that about China, I'd also say our track record on predicting uh, some of these things, in this case, Chinese demand for corn, have been rather poor. Um, so there is a tremendous amount of uncertainty with regard to these forecasts and how we look at things going into the future. And a lot of this will hinge on things that perhaps we haven't been very good at forecasting or anticipating in the past. Now, when it comes to more specifically to energy, part of what prompted this discussion in the past was the rapid run up in U.S. use for, of corn for, for the production of energy, a process which has slowed and flattened over the last several years and not much expectation for continued growth in the United States. Part of that for us in the U.S. has been the fact that when we passed this legislation, there was an expectation that we would be using more energy, that energy, that, that motor gasoline consumption in the United States would grow. In 2007, when the initial mandates were passed, expectations were that it would continue to grow. In fact, it has declined since that point, and expectations and things like CAFE standards are expected to hold back motor fuel gasoline demand in the United States. And we have a constraint on the ability to absorb ethanol in the short run, which basically means we've pushed up against the easily uh, absorbable ethanol in the United States. And this is holding back further consumption domestically outside of policy pushes, pushes to policy. And at the same time that this is going on, we've seen a, an energy price outlook that is much more subdued than it's been in recent years. And the process of the United States increasing its own energy production has knocked off a couple or, or has reduced the a couple of the arguments that have been put forth for biofuels in the past, at least for the United States, in terms of, of energy security uh, and in terms of price effects. And we've simply seen um, energy production increase domestically in the United States, and this has reduced some of the, the arguments for expanding biofuel production. And at the same time, along with it, we've seen lower natural gas prices, which also can be used to reduce greenhouse gas effects and um, in, in terms of energy production. And so overall, we've seen some of the arguments for increased biofuel use uh, superseded by increased U.S. production of energy. And some of the result of this has been that we just on Friday got uh, an overdue uh, announcement by EPA on U.S. mandate levels. And you'll see the lightly shaded boxes are what the legislation actually said, and the darker colors are what the EPA has come in and said are the lowered levels of use that will be mandated by the United States. And we've seen similar constraints placed in the European Union where food crops will be restricted in meeting their own objectives. And so here what you have is instead of a very aggressive growth path for biofuel consumption, one which is very flat and only applies moderate pressure to increased use in the United States. And probably in the short run, and perhaps Harry will talk about this, is that it provides not much flexibility in what that volume is likely to be. Okay? So, yes, it's lower, but it's also probably uh, a fairly rigid volume in terms of what the United States will actually use. So that demand is going to be rather unresponsive to price. Also, at the same time, one of the things that we'll look at here is that we've seen increased producer support estimates uh, for some countries over time and perhaps not reductions for lots of other countries. And this, uh, and this is at a time, so these, some of these policies put in place at a time when prices were high 
and volatile and rising and what will be the implication of those prices once we see production catching up to demand and even prices turning down. And in this case, just to use China as an example, not uh, saying that China is unique in any way uh, in this regard, but one of the things that these policies, one of the effects that these policies can have or other trade policies is China has growing stocks of grain and yet appear to be increasing their imports of significant other feed grains. And you can see over time, and the two arrows, the first arrow shows that um, they start to bring in a large amount of U.S. corn, at which time they then declare that it has a GMO trait and they're going to stop taking the corn, at which time they start taking U.S. distillers grains produced from the ethanol market. They then signal that they're not going to take that because of a GMO trait. Then U.S. sorghum, which is not GMO, and barley from the rest of the world starts coming in. And this is a point that they're continuing to bring in large amounts of feed and really affecting the relative prices of these agricultural commodities in the rest of the world. At the same time, they're building stocks of an equivalent commodity inside their own country. So you've got a policy here where folks are adjusting to past tight markets uh, and uh, putting policies in place that really have an effect on prices in the rest of the world and ratios of prices. Sorghum usually trades at a discount in world markets, but it's now at a premium because, the, because it's coming into China and avoids TRQ and GMO issues related to corn. They're bringing in barley. This barley is, some of it's classed as malting barley, but it's probably, be, probably being fed. They bring in distillers grains from the United States, which should historically be trading at a discount to corn, and yet it's at a 30% premium. Okay, so you've got adjustments in the market going on for what may be a short-lived policy as stocks of these commodities are being built. So I'll just conclude by making a few points, which is, you know, energy prices and production have reduced biofuel incentives. And this is particularly true in the United States, but it's going to be true in places in the rest of the world at current prices where U.S. ethanol may not be as attractive into some market, voluntary markets around the world where we do a good export business. Projections have bought for biofuel productions have, decli have declined and some mandates have been reduced. In the U.S., we've reduced our mandates. In the EU, they've constrained the amount of food crops that can go, that can go into uh, biofuel production. So now we're putting some more constrained limits on those products, reducing responsiveness, but also reducing volumes. We've seen world grain stocks fall, and I mean, grain stocks rise. We're not yet at those burdensome levels that will start uh, um, really triggering perhaps responses around the world, but where you've invited a lot of competition around the world at these high prices, and a uh, question of how much of that area stays in production and what, the, and, and what countries do when they see those adjustments taking place. Uh, internal policies in response to some of these things are being transmitted into world markets and affecting prices and price ratios. Um, and I guess commodity prices are forecast, we're forecasting commodity prices over the next decade to be flat to modestly lower from today's levels. But if prices move lower, will biofuel production pick up? I think that that's one of the big questions that we'll get back to, which is, we're more likely now than perhaps I had, would have thought uh, two or three years ago to be in a situation where we will test this even at lower oil prices. That's what I have. Great. Thank you very much. Very interesting. I take a couple of, uh, of big points out of that. The last one was just what significant influence uh, major countries can have. And then the, uh, the second one was the importance of external markets, energy markets. Uh, so we're clearly dealing with a, uh, a, a, a many-sided uh, problem. Thank you for helping us get a grip on some of the drivers there. Uh, if I can move to Harry. Uh, next, okay. you have the floor. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, 
I'm a professor, I can't speak without slides. Okay. Uh, the charge for this meeting was to explore new trends in agricultural and energy, energy markets and derive the implications for negotiators. And so I'm going to do exactly just that. And uh, I'm going to give you a picture show on the premise that seeing is believing. Um, here it is. Here is nine years from September 2005 to September 2014. We've had a tremendous amount of uh, high prices and volatility in the grains oilseed complex. The economists called these, this the silent tsunami. The economists, including the economists, were not prepared for this. They didn't expect this. The world was unable to deal with it in the short run. Um, but the paper upon which this is based, the book that is based on, I would argue that it really was an earthquake not felt around the world and that started in September of 2006. And this was a period where corn prices doubled. We had the Mexican tortilla crisis. And this was when corn and ethanol prices got linked up for the first time ever. And this linking between uh, biofuels and corn prices and crop prices and biofuels is a new phenomena that explains the entire uh, graph you have there in front of you, and it's, it's new. It's not something that we had a boom and a bust like before. This has been basically a boom with lots of instability. Uh, we've had nine years of price turmoil. Real corn prices are 75 percent higher in 2014 than in 2005. Wheat prices are 40 percent higher, and rice prices are 30 percent higher in real terms. And we're talking about the low part at the end of that graph, of that long time period. So how do we know this? Well, here's 33 months of prices before the earthquake that was not felt around the world. And we see corn prices in red very flat. We see the corn crude oil price going up the entire 33-month time period. Early on, crude oil surpassed $40 a barrel. That was a milestone. We never had $40 a barrel oil before in peacetime. And the dotted line is ethanol prices Again, delinked from oil price, uh, corn prices. Now, everybody knows that corn is energy intensive, so we know that the corn price would have been lower if oil prices hadn't gone up. The market is not stupid, nor are economists. So what happened? Well, the corn ethanol prices became linked. And here are the four prices, corn, ethanol, gasoline, crude oil. The first link now is always locked. Before it wasn't. It has a very high multiplier. It peaked at 4.82. In other words, for every one cent increase in a gallon of ethanol price meant a 4.82 cent increase per bushel of corn. This is huge. The, the last two prices are always locked, although seasonality and tornadoes can break that. But the middle two prices are the kicker. They have two states of nature. Either ethanol is locked onto gasoline when on a miles equivalent uh, pricing, or ethanol prices get delinked from gasoline and float up and away. When ethanol prices are locked onto gasoline, we now have a price floor for ethanol. It can't go lower, and that means corn prices now have a, uh, a price floor. Otherwise, mandate premiums uh, occur when it flo ethanol floats up and away, and so we get even higher corn prices. And so this is the sort of the new, uh, the two new states of nature. The price floor are floating up and away. Now, what happened in 2007, 2008? That's the price boom in agriculture that's been more analyzed than any other ever. And here we see the near futures prices for corn and soy being locked on to crude oil. And this reflects this new economic phenomena with high multipliers. This was the first time it was in full force. 2006 to 2007, it became linked. Then from then on, it was reality. This has very important implications for how to analyze the new world of agriculture. Here, this 
humble graph of the blue being in cereal price index and the dotted red crude oil price, uh, it, for me, explains it all. It has four time periods. The first time period is the earthquake not heard around the world. These corn prices went up for no reason at all. There was no, no, no shock, no inventory adjustments, nothing. The second time period is 2007, 2008, 18 months where crop prices and crude oil prices are locked on to each other all the way up and all the way down. That means a farm subsidy could have no impact on the corn price because it's locked on to crude oil prices. No supply demand shift could affect the corn price. It's the biofuel policies that determined this outcome. Then we have the third time period, and that, again, a an one and a half year time period, where now notice at the beginning of that time period, crude oil prices just fell off a cliff. But crop prices did not go with it. What's going on? Well, notice that these are mandate premiums. This is the floating up and away. Now, supply-demand shifts matter. But with oil prices going up, crop prices went down. Why? Because if fuel prices go up, you demand less fuel, you demand less uh, biofuel worldwide. Makes sense. But then at the end of that time period, at May 2010, mandate premiums dissipated to zero, and then we're back into st state of nature number one, lowest when locked. Both go up. This one year, crops had no choice but to go up with crop prices. And you read the literature, it's about a freeze in Mexico or dryness in China. There's umpteen different reasons. This was the overriding factor. Here, the last three time periods represents four years. And to me, it is the story that you can tell the fundamental story in a simple diagram, what happened and what is this new era, the biofuel era. I'm sorry, yeah, the last period they both went up together. Okay, so how low could ethanol or corn prices go when locked onto crude oil prices in these four years? Okay, the four years 2006, 7 to 2011, 12. I'm not sure I got that. The corn prices on average increased 123%. The lowest corn prices could go was $4.15 a bushel. So the float up and away part, the mandate premium was 51 cents a bushel. What that means is that 80% of the price increase over that four year time period would have occurred regardless of all other factors. That means inventory levels, it means dryness in China, China eating more meat, a freeze in Mexico cannot affect 80% of that increase. And that also means we have another $1 billion per day subsidy over that time period. This is, you know, we always talk about the WTO and the PSC, OECD, $1 billion a day. Well, that measures into a one, on average, a $1 billion a day of transfer from crop consumers to crop producers. Okay, second last slide. What would happen, and I'm fast forwarding to today, what would have happened if Brent crude prices went up instead of down? So here you see three and a half years, there's a two and a half years, of flat crude oil prices. Uh, unbelievable. It averaged $110 a barrel. Nothing happened. And all of a sudden, after last June, it dropped $60 a barrel. You'll notice that, uh, uh, you'll, you'll notice that, uh, that, uh, Corn prices went down, corn is in the red, the solid red. Corn prices went down, then it flattened out, and then it went back up, and then it kind of flattened out. But my, so mandate premiums are obviously kicking in, but now I ask the question, what happens if they went up $30 instead? Well, I have a circle there on the right-hand side column, that's $6 corn. You would have $6 corn today if Brent crude was $140 a barrel. And that means you'd get, that's the lowest it can go. You're going to get $6 corn no matter what inventory levels are, no matter what U.S. mandates are, no matter what EU mandates are, no matter if there's dryness in China or freeze in Mexico. So this is the new reality. But it went down uh, $60 instead. If corn prices 
would be over $8 if we didn't allow the tax credit to expire in a scenario where oil prices went up 30 instead of 60. So letting the tax credit expire is very, very, very important policy achievement. Okay, so the recent energy baseline prediction, which was exactly on the graph by Seth Meyer, is $140, $141 a barrel, but that's in 2013 prices by 2040. If that is achieved gradually, corn prices in real terms will never return to its previous long-term decline. In other words, here's the trend to 2005, then I projected it beyond 2005 into 2006, and those are the real corn prices above it. If the EIA is correct, we will never get below that curve again. So this fantastic long peace we've had in agriculture of decades of real decline in agricultural commodity prices would be over in my estimation given the new dynamics of the, of the world uh, agricultural markets. So this is my last slide. And this is implications for trade negotiators. So hopefully you bear with me as I go through about three or four bullet points. The first implication is, given what happened from 2006 to today, is pick your base period very carefully in trade disputes. Years when corn and, and uh, oh, by the way, uh, one thing I forgot to say is why do I say corn and then all feed grains and oil seeds and food grains move together? Well, because the correlation between the price of calories amongst rice, wheat, corn, and oil seeds is extraordinarily high. In fact, rice correlation with corn is higher than wheat and soybeans because it's substitution in demand and competition for land. So the, 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 you have to look at the crops as a package. All right, the first point. If the years when the corn and hence all other crop prices are locked on to crude oil price, that means farm subsidies have little effect on world crop prices. Why? Because all farm subsidies can do is change the amount of biofuel production and that won't affect the crude oil price very much. Um, Choose years with huge floating away premiums. 2009-10, the Great Recession. 2012-13, the U.S. drought. And after June 2014, when the crude oil prices fall off a cliff. Well, I, I think 2012, if you pick 2012-13, the U.S. drought, that would be an ironic base period for an international trade dispute on farm subsidies. Because the reason why prices are high in the first place is because of biofuels, but then the U.S. corn drought really did matter. Our supply shift affected prices more than ever because of biofuel policies. But then crop insurance and revenue insurance is a function of uh, high prices. The, more, the higher the prices, the more the, the subsidies from insurance programs are. So, and that, but then the quantity is lower, so how could the farm subsidy have that big an impact on the market? It, you can go on and on and on and look at that. The, the whole analysis of such a situation is very different than what you're used to uh, pre this biofuel era. But farm subsidies with a blend mandate, in other words, when you pick these periods with uh, floating away premiums, subsidizes fuel, that's gasoline and ethanol consumption, so ethanol prices rise and so to do corn prices. So what that means is that farm subsidy effects with a blend mandate are lower than the good old days of no biofuels. So we have two regimes or two states of nature. One, the top one, when you're locked on to crude oil prices, farm subsidies have very little effect on world crop prices. Uh, even on the way down in 2008, farm subsidies would have no impact on crop prices, even though crop prices are, 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 are going down. And, and when we're in the second state of nature, the blend mandate moderates the farm subsidy effect on world prices. Beware of crude oil price moves and if the U.S. ethanol tax credit is reinstated. So um, it is my belief this, that this story is the greatest untold story in the history of agricultural economics. It's all summarized in this book. I will put it on display in the bookstop. One copy. Uh, buy the book. <laughs> and don't make off with it, uh, because I suspect there may be some readers. Thank you. Very, very provocative uh, and insightful. Uh, if I can turn now to Stefan.
Thank you, Stefan. You have the floor. Thanks, <clears throat> Andrew. I've been asked to discuss what the implications might be for the future of the multilateral trade system of the evolving market trends. And in order to be able to do so, I need to have an idea, of course, of what the market trends are going to be and how they're likely to evolve into the future. Now, we've all been through this exciting, uh, if not really traumatic, phase of uh, the latest world food crisis, the 2007, 8, and so uh, on years with these extremely high prices. And since that, as we've seen already also in the two preceding presentations, prices uh, are coming down. And year after year, now in recent years, uh, they have declined. And the big question, of course, is, is that going to continue? It looks like for all individual agricultural commodities, in particular the food products, uh, this price decline is occurring. And the big question is, is that likely uh, to continue? And if so, will that take us back into the old world? Not a uh, new uh, normal, but the old normal. Now, one thing uh, we must keep in mind, and it also has been said in the two preceding uh, presentations, is that we are still far from being back to the old normal, the low depressed prices, even though prices have come down in recent years, they are still above uh, the lower levels uh, that we have known in the past. That, of course, doesn't yet say what will happen in the future, and I want to uh, present you the results of uh, the latest available or latest uh, published forecast that the OCD and uh, FAO have done in their uh, annual outlook uh, publications, and I apologize for still sticking to uh, the organization that I've worked with uh, in the past. That's the uh, wheat price in inflation corrected uh, terms. You uh, are reminded of the fact that, uh, that there was this uh, world food crisis in the early 70s with extremely high prices, and we've had this uh, other uh, crisis uh, in recent years. Where is this trend going uh, to go? In uh, the projections that uh, OECD and FAO have made, it's uh, like that uh, right-hand uh, part of the uh, graph. Now, if you look at these two uh, different periods, uh, you find that there was this declining trend that we've uh, all known all the time declining in real and inflation corrected terms. But then if you uh, take this more recent period, uh, prices have reached a higher level. And as far as these projections uh, are concerned, they are not appearing to come back uh, down to the lower level. This is true for wheat. Uh, it also is uh, true for uh, other prices. If you take uh, the average of the forecast, the projected prices uh, for various products uh, and compare that uh, to the longer term base period 1992 to 2006, you can see prices are uh, projected in real terms, in inflation corrected terms, uh, to be uh, above the old normal by something like 20, 30 in part 40%. If you take the more recent base period of only 2000 to 2006, which excludes uh, the high price uh, period in the mid uh, 90s, uh, future prices are projected to be above uh, the old prices by a, even a larger margin. Now, these are the projections uh, that OECD and FAO have uh, published last year. You'll have to wait for another two weeks before they come up uh, with their uh, most recent projections. I have them with me. I cannot uh, <laughs> really let you know what their results are because, uh, quite obviously, uh, they are not yet publicly available. But I can share with you uh, the uh, result that uh, they are not really very much. They are not fundamentally different from last year's projections. Some prices are projected to be a little higher than uh, what they said last year. Some are projected to be a little lower. That's particularly true for the corn price. 
That, of course, has a lot to do uh, with the development uh, of oil prices and all the implications that that also has for uh, biofuels. Uh, and, of course, uh, the future of oil prices, uh, and I don't need to explain that to you after Harry has spoken, uh, will uh, be very, very important uh, for the future of uh, prices uh, for agricultural commodities. And, of course, we don't quite precisely know where oil prices are uh, going to go in the future. So uh, the implication that all this has, I believe is uh, that we can't really be uh, absolutely sure of what the uh, future new normal will be. Will it be uh, the old normal or will it be a higher level of prices? It is conceivable that prices will decline again to their old level. Firstly, purely subjectively, I don't give that uh, more than a, let's say, 20 to 30 percent uh, probability. It is uh, absolutely possible uh, that food prices will remain higher than we've known them in the past. In my mind, that's uh, the larger probability, say 70, 80 percent. In any case, we'll have to expect them uh, to be more volatile in the past for a number of uh, reasons. And if you take these three different uh, perspectives, then, of course, uh, they have implications for uh, trade policies and the trade policy framework in the future. If we have a significant decline, uh, that uh, is something that will have important implications for the future of support levels, and I'll come to talk about that in a minute. Uh, if uh, prices remain high, uh, then, of course, uh, that will have uh, very important repercussions for food security. And again, uh, I'll discuss that. Uh, and volatility will be with us in any case, and that has implications uh, in particular for social stability. Now, let me take you through these three different perspectives. What happens if uh, prices decline again? Now, of course, uh, that will uh, indeed have uh, implications for support levels, but uh, those implications will very much depend on the nature of policies uh, that we see in, uh, in particular major uh, countries. Quite a number of member countries of the OECD have meanwhile decoupled their support from both production and more important in our context, from prices, uh, and uh, where that is the case, uh, declining uh, world market prices will not have any implications for their support levels. But then there are a couple of countries uh, that have recoupled their support levels to prices again, in particular the United States. And uh, if uh, prices were to decline uh, significantly in international markets, uh, that will uh, automatically drive up uh, the level of support in the United States. <laughs> After all, a very important uh, country uh, in terms of international trade policy in agriculture. Emerging economies, many of them, uh, on the other hand, haven't really decoupled uh, their uh, policies from price developments. Uh, on the contrary, uh, quite a number of them have increased their support levels in the past. Look uh, at uh, the shares uh, that seven major emerging economies had in uh, the total of support in the OECD area and these seven major emerging countries uh, in, uh, in the period uh, 2002 to seven, uh, they had something like 17 percent of all support in uh, that aggregate. By 2012, that share was uh, already 45 percent, and it's uh, probably grown further, except we don't yet have the uh, more recent data. Uh, and uh, given the nature of policies in these countries, a decline in international prices uh, will uh, probably drive up uh, the uh, share of emerging economies uh, and the total support. This, of course, is support as measured by the OECD. It's not domestic support as defined in the WTO. It's the economic concept of uh, support. Now, 
uh, that's uh, what I wanted to say about uh, the uh, scenario of declining international prices. Now, if uh, prices were uh, to remain high, which I consider uh, more likely, uh, then, of course, uh, we are in a different world. The declining prices, the depressed prices uh, scenario, that's the traditional uh, get WTO scenario, uh, trying to uh, limit support levels, levels of protection, uh, export competition policies. Uh, all this is of particular relevance when prices are depressed. Uh, but when prices uh, are high, uh, we have a different scenario. And the issues then is not so much what happens to farm support, but what happens to food security. Uh, and uh, that puts us uh, back uh, into the uh, era where uh, we were dealing with uh, food crisis. Uh, we had one such era in the uh, early 70s, uh, as we've seen before. We had it uh, again uh, in the late uh, 2000, uh, the, the late part of the uh, first decade of the 2000s. Uh, and uh, in that, uh, in, in both of these periods, uh, governments uh, of the developed countries have said, we must do more about food security in developing countries. Uh, we must, in particular, assist the development uh, of agriculture uh, in the uh, south. Uh, in the early 70s, that meant uh, that the share of official development assistance uh, that went to agriculture has grown a lot in response to these price developments. Uh, when prices uh, subsided, uh, then people forgot about uh, that again, and the uh, attention to agriculture declined. Uh, we've seen a bit of an increase in recent years uh, again, uh, quite uh, less than uh, what happened in the early 70s. Uh, but again, uh, that is uh, evaporating uh, more recently, uh, and uh, it's, it's not something that should, uh, again, evolve like it did in the early 70s, and therefore I believe there is uh, a good reason uh, to uh, put support to agricultural development uh, in the South on a more uh, permanent basis, uh, and in a uh, report uh, that we've done for the E15 initiative of ICTSD, we've suggested a new instrument of financial solidarity between uh, what governments do for their farmers in uh, the richer countries and uh, what they do uh, to improve food security in poor countries. In particular, we've said, why uh, shouldn't uh, the richer countries uh, provide uh, assistance to agricultural development in the poorer countries in relation to what they do for their own farmers. Uh, for example, uh, what they uh, do is measured uh, through the overall trade distorting support concept. And one could, for example, argue why should they uh, provide only 1% of what they do for their farmers uh, to uh, help and assist agricultural development in the poorer countries. Uh, if they were to do so, that would be an order of magnitude of two billion US dollars a year, uh, something uh, like 20% of official development assistance uh, to agriculture, and it would indeed help. Now, uh, just a few words uh, on uh, volatility. Volatility. Uh, is uh, typically of asymmetric nature for commodity markets, in particular agricultural commodity markets, uh, with very large price peaks uh, and uh, much uh, less uh, price reductions in uh, depressed price uh, periods. And that means uh, that, uh, again, food security is uh, but in particular, uh, it's particularly at risk uh, when volatility is uh, large, and therefore more needs to be done uh, in that context as well uh, for food security. Uh, and there are a couple of suggestions uh, that one uh, can also find in the report we did for uh, the E15. Uh, one uh, could, uh, in particular, in, should do more about export restrictions uh, because they have been very clearly shown to be a major factor uh, contributing uh, to 
uh, volatility on uh, agricultural commodity markets. There are all sorts of things uh, one can do about export restrictions uh, and make the system more symmetric uh, so that it's not only market access uh, but also uh, export restrictions uh, that are uh, disciplined uh, in the multilateral system. Uh, on biofuels, uh, which also add to volatility, uh, a number of things uh, one uh, could do, uh, in particular to create uh, more transparency, but also uh, to agree on constraints on support policies. Uh, and there is quite a bit uh, that uh, the rich countries of this world uh, can do uh, in order to assist uh, poorer countries uh, to avoid food crisis, in particular uh, through uh, small targeted emergency reserves, uh, but also uh, strengthened social safety uh, nets. In uh, conclusion, uh, it's not really uh, absolutely clear, at least not to me, what the new normal uh, is going to be. I believe uh, there is quite some probability uh, that it may be higher level of food prices, uh, but that's not absolutely certain. Uh, there is uh, a very high probability that we'll see more volatility. Uh, and uh, if we take uh, these possible uh, scenarios for the future, uh, it is important uh, that uh, the multilateral system goes beyond limiting farm support. It should also, to be on the safe side, uh, do more to guard against high food prices and uh, their negative implications for food security. And even though some of the uh, suggestions uh, that I've presented here uh, go beyond trade policies uh, in a specific sense, uh, and therefore uh, you might well argue they don't belong in the WTO. I believe uh, if uh, one can only agree on such measures, uh, that uh, would help uh, everybody to have more trust uh, in the uh, trade system, uh, and uh, it would certainly assist people to uh, see that trade is beneficial uh, also for food security in developing countries. Uh, if you want to read more about uh, the uh, policy options uh, that I've only very briefly mentioned here, uh, look at the uh, E15 report, uh, which is uh, available out uh, at the disk uh, there. Uh, there was a recent volume uh, that the OSD has published uh, out of uh, its uh, Global Forum for Agriculture, uh, and I have a piece in there. And I need to do a bit of a commercial as well, like Harry did already for a book uh, that has recently appeared uh, by Tim Josling and myself, where we uh, look at uh, the history of uh, the agricultural trade relations between the United States and the European uh, Union in the uh, past 50 years, including, of course, uh, a uh, good discussion of uh, TTIP implications, uh, and it has to do with what I've said here because it shows uh, how countries have responded, rightly or wrongly, uh, to changing levels of uh, international market prices uh, and what the distortions are uh, that that has caused uh, for their agricultural sectors. Thanks a lot. Good. Thank you very much, Stefan, uh, and for bringing us into this broader broader picture and scenarios. And I think with the previous presentations, we have some, uh, some new drivers that maybe have not been in discussion enough, uh, along with other drivers that are uh, outside the control of agricultural discussions, but obviously significant. So um, we have a lot on the table. If I can turn to Leanne, uh, go at it, please. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um it's been really a pleasure to hear all these ideas coming forward today, and maybe I should do my the classic WTO disclaimer, which is I'm here not as a secretary at official, but in my personal capacity. So these are all ideas of my own. Um, so as I was thinking about what what can I offer that's different from what is being offered, but feeds off of um, the ideas that have come forward, I was reminded of. Um, a comment that my father used to say, which was he had a colleague who would say to him, may you live in interesting times. And of course, nobody knows if that's either a curse or a blessing, mm -hmm. right? So clearly, I think um, 
what we heard from these three presentations is that there's a lot of new things happening in agricultural markets. And people are trying to understand what that means about what we can expect going forward. So I think what we expect is that there's likely to be less predictability. We don't know how to forecast necessarily every situation. There's changes that are happening in the regulatory and environment as well. Um, so change is the new normal, I think. And the question I was asking myself was, if we're living in a world where we're, we maybe have less confidence that we know what to predict, then what do we need from our institutions to help us get through um, and, and make good decisions, right? So that I, I'll make a link back to the trading system for obvious reasons. So I think what we heard from Seth was um, quite a lot of detail about what he sees in terms of agricultural market prices. Um, he suggests that prices are likely to, to flatten and maybe not as at high levels as we expected. Um, Harry talked about different kinds of um, policies that are happening in energy markets and how those interact with what outcomes might be in agricultural markets, and that's a new link that we haven't really, I mean, newish link, but we're grappling with what that means in terms of how it affects who benefits from agricultural policies. And then Stefan um, sort of broadened the story to all these other factors <laughs> that relate to agricultural markets, and, um, and I would add an additional factor, which is climate change. So we're looking at lots of different factors and the way they interact, um, which means that agricultural markets don't necessarily behave the way that w 10 years ago we thought they would be behaving. Um, so some of, the, some of the areas of unpredictability that I think were, were um, drawn out by the papers were, we don't really know what to expect in energy markets with prices. We've got new, um, new production technologies that are being adopted, for example, in the United States, so we don't exactly know how to forecast what's happening on the energy side. We also don't necessarily know precisely how prices from energy markets link over into agricultural market prices. I mean, we can see correlations, we can see the pictures, um, but some of the, some of the sort of variables that would be helping us explain with more precision are still not clear. Um, we also see regulatory divergences. So some of the examples that came up on the panel were how different countries um, regulate genetically modified crops or how they're regulating energy markets domestically. And divergences are going to have an effect on the way the world markets um, react um, in an international sense. So they spill over into the international um, setting. So I guess the main conclusion that I would say is it's harder to predict what's going on, <laughs> what's going to be happening in the future, um, that we should be expecting things to be changing and maybe changing more often. So what we need is to build institutions that are adaptable. So of course, sitting in the World Trade Organization, we know that it can be quite hard for this organization to adapt. <laughs> and. Um, you know, for many different reasons. We have many members, there's the bureaucratic tendencies of um, making it hard to change quickly. Um, so I was asking myself, well, what have people said about what helps organizations adapt to change? Um, so I went to the Nobel Prize uh, webpage, and one of the recent Nobel Prize winners was Eleanor Ostrom, and she, was, she used to study collective collective action and how groups create rules around managing resources. And what she found, actually, was that collective action, um, if you have institutions that are built, have built-in monitoring and surveillance processes, they actually create a higher level of trust. So in contrast, if you have systems where there isn't monitoring and surveillance embedded in it, um, you have less trust. So and this is probably what you would expect from a secretariat official. <laughs> but what that to me says is that we need to make sure we're also investing in these processes inside the, inside the system, making sure that our transparency mechanisms work effectively. Um, 
there's another person who's been recently writing about transparency in the WTO, which is a professor named Bob Wolf, and he talks about um, different layers of transparency. So um, in the context of some of our committees, you could have the first layer of transparency being that members provide information about what they're doing domestically. The second layer of transparency is members asking each other questions to clarify what's actually in our notifications. And the third layer that he talks about is uh, a layer where you provide additional aggregation or additional synthesis of the information that's been provided so that there's, in a sense, a collective understanding about what the information means. So, um, you know, each of those three things, mo many of our committees do those. <laughs> the Committee on Agriculture does those, and sometimes we do it better than others. I would say um, recently we've gotten better at using technology to make sure that we're being transparent about what what information is available and how quickly it's available so we have databases in the secretariat that everyone can access. In my view, I think there's still room for more synthesis for sort of that higher level of, of thinking about what the information is and what it says about what we do collectively. Um, so maybe just to uh, to to wrap up, one other thing that Professor Wolf talks about is that, in his view, the WTO evolves through discussions among members, and it's not just through these, what he says are episodic negotiations, which are sort of punctuated changes in the rules. So, um, so the discussions in committees are really important to get institutions within the WTO to be evolving, to deal with the change. And one in one of his papers, I'll use it as my conclusion, he says, Without transparency, trade agreements are just words on paper. Thanks. Thank you, and a, and a core principle, uh, an issue that's come up in uh, many of our discussions about uh, a variety of issues around not only agriculture but other, other trade-related issues is the lack of information and the ability to, to do something with it and make sense of it. And clearly we have a lot of that kind of dynamic going on here in this discussion. Uh, if I can please turn over to Stephen, you have the floor. Thank you very much, um, Andrew, and um, thank you to the other presenters before me. Um, of course, like Leanne, uh, my comments today are made in my own individual capacity and um, do not necessarily reflect the, the views of the Commonwealth Secretariat. Um, in preparing for today, I noted that um, trends and projections are uh, usually disrupted by external and exogenous, uh, usually unforeseen uh, circumstances which emerge. So the new normal, um, or what the future new normal would be, would be conditioned by factors which perhaps we have not considered yet. So what is the new normal? Is the new normal, um, as some have suggested, the secular decline in prices on food and agricultural markets? Is the current downward trend in a consequence of lower energy prices, or are these trends a result of improved efficiencies in agricultural markets and the tapering of demand in Europe and in Asia? More importantly, does the WTO have a role to play in re reducing price and market volatility? It is undeniable that the price of food on the world market has declined in recent years. The FAO Food Price Index, the FPI, a measure of the movement on food prices, averaged 171 points in April of 2015, which is down 1.2% from March and approximately 19.2% from its level a year ago. It should be noted that the, av the April average put the index at its lowest level since June 2010. The decline in the index was supported by declines in dairy, sugar, cereal, and vegetable oil prices. In contrast, the average price of meat rose in April for the first time in 12 months. I will not go into further detail, but suffice it to say that the basket of commodities as comprised in the FAO food price index has been in steady decline since 2011. Of course, this decline is in sharp reversal and contrast from the historical run-up in prices started in 2000 with peak volatility between 2006 and 2011. This run-up in prices and subsequent volatility 
was enabled and, inab and exacerbated by weather-related crop losses, export restrictions, domestic policies, high oil prices, which of course is a critical input not only for fertilizers and feed, but also for transportation. According to research conducted by the price on price volatility, volatility in agricultural markets by the OECD, volatility was higher during the decade started in the year 2000 than it had been in the previous two decades. Some of the key reasons for this volatility include changing market conditions led by increasing oil prices, weather-related phenomena, and increased participation of non-commercial actors in agricultural markets through the securitization and trade in agricultural-backed products. Indeed, the relationship between agricultural prices and world oil prices intensified with the com commercialization of biofuel. According to a policy report undertaken by the FOO, UNCTAD, OECD, WTO, and World Bank, Depending on the relative price of agricultural crops and oil, biofuels may become even more profitable in some jurisdictions. Thus, high and raising oil prices during the, the decade of 2000, rather, thus high and rising oil prices during the decade starting in the year 2000 contributed to higher demand for biofuels. Therefore, high and volatile oil prices contributed to higher and more volatile agricultural prices, resulting, from high, resulting in higher input costs such as fertilizers, seeds, and transportation, as well as elevated demand for inputs used in the production of biofuels such as cane, maize, and vegetables. Such a correlation between high and volatile oil prices and demand for key inputs for biofuels has impacted on the price of food used as inputs for biofuel, as well as substitute products. In reference to the time frame 2006 to 2008, an OECD Food Agriculture and Fisheries paper number 52 noted that the increase in food prices took place in the context of a general rise in commodity prices led by oil. A key outturn of the current lower trending oil prices is reduced demand and lower price pressures on the key inputs for biofuels. Hence, food prices have continued to trend downwards in line with lower oil prices. Ultimately, low and stable oil prices in the medium term will continue to contribute to lower prices and more stability in agricultural markets. Are low prices and stable agricultural markets the new normal? Well, it depends on a number of other factors. One, will the growth in agricultural production keep pace with growing demand? Expanding populations and growing incomes in emerging and developing countries will contribute to increased demand for food. According to the reference policy paper, by the year 2050, the world's population will exceed 9 billion and the demand for food will increase by between 70 and 100 percent. However, increased demand by itself is not necessarily or will not necessarily have a disproportionate impact on agricultural markets. We must, however, take a cautious approach, uh, approach drawing conclusions based on not drawing, pro, not drawing conclusions based on projections of increased demand. For example, in the year 2000, the OECD reported or predicted that the price of crops and most livestock products would be higher in both real and nominal terms in the decade 2, 2019 than, it, than they would during the 2007-2008 price spikes. Of course, these projections have proven to be incorrect based on the FAO price index. It could be argued that the major contributing factor to this outturn can be ascribed to significant reductions in world oil prices since 2011 and a concomitant decline in the demand for key inputs for biofuels. However, population growth and higher incomes in emerging markets and developing countries will place significant upward pressures on prices in the medium to long term. Two, what impact will weather-related phenomena and climate change have on food prices and agricultural markets? Climatic factors indisputably contribute to the price spikes in 2007 
and again in 2010. In 2008, an already tight market for wheat was aggravated by drought, weather-related low yields and fire in key export markets. Although it is not clear whether such outturns are cyclical or transitory in nature, or whether they are consequences of long-term climate change, experts agree that such phenomena will increasingly play a disruptive role in agriculture production and along relevant value chains. In this view, it is likely that phenomena related to climate change will increasingly impact on the supply of food and be a disruptive element in agricultural markets, thus amplifying volatility in not only agricultural markets, but also in upstream markets such as insurance and financial services. Three, and finally, what impact has the securitization of agricultural commodities had on volatility in agricultural markets? Investments in financial derivatives backed by agricultural commodities increased sharply in the mid-2000s. However, it is not clear the extent to which securitization has had an impact on increased market prices or the stoking of volatility. What is clear, however, is that speculation by non-commercial actors in financial and commodity markets can impact on production decisions in a manner inconsistent with real market demand. Why is it to maintain stable markets? The spike in prices in agricultural products increased the number of hungry people in the world from 820 million in 2007 to over 1 billion by 2009. Hence, volatility in agricultural markets have real impacts on the livelihoods and welfare of a significant proportion of the world's population. High prices place significant strains on the current account balances of net food importing countries and on fis the fiscal position of developing countries that are forced to intervene in the market and provide subsidies. What there is, therefore is the rule of the WTO? The WTO can support better function in agricultural markets by creating stronger rules against export restrictions that distort markets and place upward pressures on wool prices. Additionally, rules on domestic support schemes should be tightened, particularly when such support discourages supply and constrains international trade in food and agricultural products. Two, WTO rules that allow for stockpiling should not distort the proper functioning of the market. C, the WTO should support the development of supply side capacities, particularly in small economies that do not have the fiscal space to make adjustments in the face of price surges on the international market. The question, have we entered a new normal? No, unless actions are taken to delink oil from agricultural prices through inter alia greater efficiency in agricultural production, regulations are imposed in, on derivatives that impact on international price of food, and finally, unless the WTO plays a more meaningful role in supporting the proper functioning of the agricultural market. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. So we, uh, we made a, a very extensive tour, and I think uh, covered a number of areas. Uh, external factors, climate has come up, uh, energy markets, uh, questions about where's the, where, where, where should these, if they're not in the WTO, I think where, where should they be addressed? Um, so the question of governance, not only the quality of information, but uh, we've been already just in this short panel presented with uh, trends that far exceed the current agenda here uh, and may well lead to other places. So. I think we, uh, we have a lot on the table to keep us uh, asking what is the right question still. If you'd like to offer uh, part of what the right question is, I invite you to do so or part of the right answer. Uh, so I would like to open the floor now, if I may, uh, to your questions and comments. Uh, please try to be as uh, brief as you uh, reasonably can so that we can provide room for uh, discussion. And then if there's uh, additional room, We'll give you a second chance. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, first of all, I would like to thank the ICTSD and the organizers of this uh, forum, which is very informative. And I also thank the, the contributors, the professors uh, who presented their scholarly uh, uh, 
uh, undertakings in, before this body. Can, can well, you please just my name your is name uh, Jerome well. Buni from you. the Philippines Mission. Now, uh, I always say myself that you know nobody can really predict what the, uh, what the future lies ahead of us. We can only have uh, an educated guess, and which the distinguished professors presented their, their perhaps their own insights on what the future lies. But I think what is clear about uh, with these export restrictions, with this uh, climate change, and even Professor Tagerman somehow uh, anticipated that perhaps the, the new trend, the new normal is higher volatility. And if I were a farmer or a consumer, uh, I will always don't like the opposite of being low price or high price. And uh, farmers doesn't like prices to go down consistently over time while the consumers are happy about it. But prices drives investment, as, as you have presented by the distinguished uh, last two speakers. That investment in PAC came when uh, the volatility in the 2006, 2007, peak in 2011. And I would surmise, or I would think that the reason why prices are going, up, going down is because a lot of countries, both developed and developing, invested in agriculture. So you have a lot of production uh, that will somehow uh, trying to fill the gaps in terms of uh, demand. So the question perhaps that we should be asking is, are we, really, are we really facing a highly volatile or is high volatility the new normal? I think that's the question. And if the answer is yes, how do we do that? How do we relate that in the WTO rules? And it would seem to me that this is the more, most difficult part uh, in the WTO. Uh, if you were a rich country, there are many ways how you manage volatility from international markets. You see, basically, you provide subsidies if you are an affluent country. But if you are not an affluent country, how would you shield yourself, yourself from the uh, volatility from the external market? You have QRs, you have SSM, you have SSG. It depends where you are. If you are poor, perhaps you would choose QR, you would choose this kind of, uh, I call it volatility management. And I've seen Tagerman's uh, paper on managing volatility, and, and, and he mentioned about some of these kind of things. Uh, this is very relevant because if low prices, discourages production, then you will have a cyclical, you know, lower price will be followed by higher prices, and lower prices, uh, higher prices followed by downward pressure to prices. So it's a cycle, it's, a, it's going to be a never ending cycle. And it seems to me that is not the problem, because either way, you hurt the farmers or you hurt the consumers. What is important, I think, is how the multilateral trading system would allow volatility to be managed at its international level as well as at the domestic level. I don't have the answer. It so happened that the Philippines is not an affluent country that we support uh, such kind of instrument for managing volatility like SSG or SSM or quantitative restriction, which is still within the, uh, within the WTO framework uh, as it, uh, in, 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 in general. So the question to, 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 to the distinguished gentleman is how, how do we address volatility? Because it seems to me this is the problem. And the next question perhaps is to reverse it. Would freeing up everything, liberalizing everything, stabilize volatility? Because if liberalization would stabilize volatility, then perhaps that's the, that's the answer. So I don't have the answer. It's a question for, 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 you, for all of you and perhaps for, for everyone here. Thank you. Good, very good points, relevant, thank you. Uh, can I take a couple of other questions, please? Yes, uh, Ahmad. Hi, Ahmad Bahalim, Gates Foundation. Um, 
two questions. One sort of a request for clarification from Stefan, um, and perhaps Seth, if he's still on the line. Uh, could you describe how sensitive your particular models are to recent changes in, in prices? So I remember a couple of years back from the OECD FAO outlook that prices were projected to trend upwards 10 to 15 percent. I think I'm thinking of 2010 or so. Um, and, and we look at uh, the, the recent graphs, and now we're saying they're trending downwards. Um, I imagine that the models are responding to, to recent changes in prices. Uh, perhaps uh, either, either one of you could, could explain how the models work. Um, and then the second question would be, you're all very brilliant academics, uh, smart, uh, but we're very grateful for your contribution here. But some of us have to report back to people with far more limited um, attention spans. I, I imagine most of the folks in this room. Could you describe to us perhaps what an advocacy agenda uh, for those of us working on these issues would be in the short, medium, and long term, maybe say a year, five years, 10? Thank you. Good, thank you. Yes, can I take one or two more? Yes, Mr. Miller. <laughs> well, Rolf Müller, former commission official. As a former negotiator, agricultural negotiator of the Uruguay round, I dare ask a question in this building. What does this new normal mean for the Doha round negotiations on agriculture? I mean, uh, what we have in the Doha round, if I'm not mistaken, is still the modalities of 2008. Uh, not much progress has been made since. But does this new normal mean we should pursue what in the modalities paper has been outlined, which means more access, um, a new discipline on domestic support, and of course, uh, the abolition of export subsidies and other forms of support. Is this still relevant in this new context, or is it not? And if yes, if, if, if it is not, in which way it should be adjusted? Good, thank you very much. Good question also. One more question, I turn back to the panel. Anyone? Okay, so let me, let me go back to our panel. Uh, I'm hoping that Seth is still connected uh, and listening, and I'm wondering if you would like an opportunity to come in now, uh, Seth, with uh, any, either any comments on the presentations you heard or on responses to our uh, very on-point questions. Can you all hear me now? I'm, I'm up, I think. Yes. All right, great. Yes, no, I, I, very good presentations. Uh, folks covered a lot of ground that I had anticipated they would, so I, I wanted to cover a bit about the market uh, background as well, too. I guess my only response would be that, you know, when we talk about flat prices and the graph shown in real dollars, declining real dollar prices, flat and nominal prices, I think it's important for us to, to think about what the actual return to production is at those price levels as well, too. When we think about, and, and this is in response to how sensitive are the, are, are the models to this, we, are, we always tend to probably overweight near-term effects. We've anticipated a return to, to prices lower than we had seen uh, in the past several years. We're at that level now. But I think you also have to consider here that margins to producers are incredibly important right now as well, too, which is this increase in prices and this investment in agriculture has brought with it an increase in cost of production, particularly in places like the United States. So as prices have softened, you say we're still above prices that we were many years ago, but we're at or below cost of production in the United States. And it is at those times, I guess, when I get concerned about actions being taken um, that, that want to address what is a, uh, an adjustment in the marketplace over this period of time where we're coming back down to, to even, even if prices are flat, this will require adjustment in, in producers' output. 
both in the United States and around the world. Um, I would just th that would be my only comment at this point. But I'm I'm here and I'm listening. Great, thank you. Uh, let me just go back in in my original order, if I can, so give uh, Harry a chance to comment. And again, please feel free to comment on uh, the questions or any of the other presentations. Oh, okay. Um, like everybody, you take the take the ones that you like. Don't take the ones you don't like, uh, and add any ones that you think are missing. Well, there's, there's, there's nothing I don't like. Um, I don't want to hide from anything. Um, you know, there was, there was comments about uh, export restriction, developing country polish response. Um, what we found in our research was for the time periods in which uh, crop prices were locked onto crude oil prices, the developing country polish response uh, did not impact the world price. It couldn't. And really the developing country polish response was in response to high prices, not high prices due to developing country polish response. But for this year, if there's developing country policy response now with crude oil prices dropping off the cliff, then you're definitely going to have an impact and in other periods when, uh, in other periods as well. But for the two key time periods, uh, export restrictions were basically lowering the domestic price in the country that imposed the restriction, not raising the world price. Those were the two high price periods. But I'm not recommending export restrictions. Uh, I think we have to get those under control in the WTO. Um, you know, the, the first question was about, you know, saying that prices are going down because of uh, output increases in investment. Well, you know, the, the old uh, saying was a solution of high prices is high prices. But I showed you my first graph, I showed you nine years where high prices were apparently not a solution to high prices. I mean, traditionally it was, it always was. This is a different era. This is a totally different era. That can go away tomorrow if oil prices go to $15 a barrel. And don't, don't be mistaken, very smart people are predicting that. But otherwise, you know, this is a new era. As I know other academics who say the solution to low prices is low prices. That is not why prices went up in September 2006. Prices went up for a very new phenomenon. This price link between ethanol and corn and other crops and biofuels, it had nothing to do with low prices causing being a good cure for low prices, just like always high prices a cure for high prices. So uh, just a few things um, like that I come across every, every time I listen to the comments. In terms of how to deal with volatility and what the WTO should do, I'll let uh, Stefan Tangerman um, uh, handle that. I wouldn't be silly enough to even... Uh, in terms of what the implications are for the Doha negotiations, higher prices means lower subsidies, uh, except for crop insurance and revenue insurance in the United States. You get higher subsidies then. Um, when Stefan Tangerman made the point that uh, when you have lower prices, we'll have lower subsidies, we will have higher PLC payments in the United States, but if history is any uh, uh, guard, the subsidies for crop insurance and revenue insurance will, will drop because these are revenue insurance and when prices are high, you get higher changes. And so you might expect lower subsidies than that. I don't know. Um, so it's not clear. But going back to Doha, for sure, TRQs or tariff rate quotas are going to be less of an issue in terms of restrictions given the way in which world prices and trade in dairy and has taken off and everything. Export subsidies have been abolished, as you say. But everything on the agenda should be carried out. There's no question about that. Uh, presumably the urgency is, is, has been less. Maybe now it's going to get higher again as prices go down. Um, okay, well, um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. If, if you allow me to come in sometime later when I think of something. Of course. Yes, uh, Stefan, can I come to you? Yeah, I take the challenge up. <laughs> Uh, to, to try and respond uh, to these excellent questions that the colleague uh, from the Philippine mission has asked about volatility and what the WTO could possibly do about it. And I think uh, we need to think about this in uh, two different uh, chapters, if you like. 
uh, first of all, is there anything the WTO can possibly do to reduce volatility on international markets? And second, once we have a given level of volatility, what should it perhaps allow countries to do to try uh, and buffer that uh, in uh, regard to what the domestic implications are for these countries. Now, f for the first part of that, uh, you were asking the excellent question, would trade liberalization reduce volatility? Very clearly uh, it would. Uh, there is a lot of research on that, but it's also very easy to understand. International markets for food and uh, agricultural commodities are relatively thin in terms of the percentage uh, of global output that's being traded internationally. That's not true for tropical products, but for uh, the uh, temperate zone products, uh, that's uh, definitely true. A few percentage points uh, or low two-digit uh, percentage uh, points uh, where uh, we have international trade. That makes them uh, susceptible to volatility in any case, uh, but they are artificially thinned further uh, through countries' uh, attempts at insulating their domestic markets against international volatility, which really means uh, that uh, the share of global output then can actually buffer volatility the natural volatility that we will always have, and with climate change, we'll have even more of that. The share of uh, the global output can, that can buffer that, of course, is reduced by countries' unwillingness to uh, share in the buffering in their domestic markets, and hence that uh, smaller part of the market will uh, show even more volatility because uh, only price variations uh, can re-establish uh, the equilibrium once uh, a uh, output decline uh, or a, a low level of uh, stocks has uh, increased prices or uh, we have had a reverse uh, development uh, in markets. Uh, so, yes, trade liberalization helps in uh, any regard. Uh, what also helps is uh, to prevent countries from uh, ad hoc measures uh, that try uh, to stabilize the domestic market at the expense of international uh, trade. Uh, and export restrictions that have been mentioned a number of times uh, today uh, do that. Uh, and uh, when I say export restrictions, I mean that in the broad sense of the term, not only quantitative restrictions, export taxes can do the same thing. Uh, and I could continue a bit uh, along those lines. Uh, I don't want to speak too long. Biofuels and uh, beginning to uh, talk about international disciplines uh, to the extent that uh, individual national governments can support the production and consumption of biofuels uh, could also add uh, to uh, stability or reduce volatility on international markets because uh, the uh, production and consumption of biofuels, in particular uh, where uh, they depend on mandates, are uh, not responsive to price changes and therefore add an element of inelasticity to international markets. Uh, so that's a whole new uh, playground, if you like, uh, for the WTO, if only it uh, wanted to take that uh, challenge up again. So far for the moment, uh, for what the WTO can do to reduce volatility on international markets. But even if all that were to happen, we would still have a lot of volatility. And then we come to the question, uh, what should we allow individual countries to do in order to uh, prevent too uh, much volatility uh, affecting their domestic markets? And uh, there I must say I have a lot of sympathy uh, for allowing, in particular, poorer countries uh, where the domestic uh, market, in, in particular where domestic producers have a much uh, more limited capacity to buffer changes uh, and in particular uh, buffer 
uh, reductions in their liquidity uh, to allow these countries uh, to take away some of that uh, instability from their domestic producers through all the types of mechanisms uh, that you've mentioned. I don't need to go into any details there. But uh, I would uh, immediately want to add Let's think of volatility not only in terms of uh, what low prices can do to farmers, uh, but let's also think about uh, what high prices uh, will do to food consumers because, and I want to repeat that again, uh, the typical feature of volatility on agricultural markets is that we get these huge price peaks uh, and much smaller price depressions uh, in some periods. Uh, and therefore, uh, the more a uh, serious problem in my mind with volatility is on the food consumer side where people are so poor uh, that even under normal prices they have difficulties uh, buying enough food, uh, not to speak then of these extremely high prices that we can have and therefore we need more protection against uh, that through safety nets, uh, targeted uh, uh, food reserves and uh, all the rest of it. I hope I've uh, <laughs> cut a long, long story sufficiently short for this particular discussion. Aman, how sensitive are uh, models uh, to all sorts of changes uh, that might affect uh, projections? Uh, typically, the modelers run their models not only for one uh, baseline scenario, but uh, they do sensitivity analysis, typically now with uh, stochastic uh, variations in all sorts uh, of exogenous uh, variables. Uh, and when uh, you will see uh, this year's uh, outlook of uh, OSV FAO, you, you will see these bands of future prices uh, that they show around uh, the baseline projection. Uh, and that gives you an idea of uh, what could happen. So it's not like uh, people who are dealing with these models don't know that there are sorts of uncertainties, uh, but uh, what they want to present is something, and it's a bit along uh, the lines of your second question, that's easy to understand. Uh, that is the one baseline projection, but everybody knows around that uh, there is a whole channel of uncertainty uh, and people uh, dealing with these models know that precisely well. What's the advocacy agenda? Flexibility uh, now, uh, and in particular deal not only uh, with uh, the implications of low prices, that's the traditional WTO business, uh, but also look at uh, the implications of potentially uh, long-run high levels of prices and the implications that that might have in particular uh, for food consumers. Herr Müller, if only I knew what the implications of uh, all this uh, were for the ongoing negotiations, uh, I would be extremely to happen to see any progress at all in these negotiations. Uh, if I uh, then were uh, to think about uh, what the additional burdens are uh, that are placed uh, on the shoulders of negotiators with all these uncertainties, uh, then I'm getting a little afraid uh, that we might see even less progress in the future than uh, we've seen uh, over the last uh, seven years and even over the last seven weeks or so. Uh, but uh, having said that, it is clear uh, that in particular, in case we should see a low price scenario, which again, I must say, in my subjective mind, uh, has the smaller probability as compared to the high price scenario, then of course, countries uh, are likely to be even less prepared uh, than they uh, have uh, appeared to be uh, over the last uh, weeks, months, and uh, years to engage uh, in uh, tough disciplines uh, on uh, both uh, domestic support uh, and tariff cuts. If, on the other hand, uh, I'm right in suggesting that prices are likely to be relatively high relative to uh, what the old normal was, then I would suggest people should be a little more courageous uh, in allowing uh, these uh, quantitative disciplines both on the domestic support side and the market access side uh, to be relatively demanding because uh, after all, all this uh, has been introduced in order to protect 
producers to protect farmers, uh, the domestic economies, uh, and with high prices, uh, they don't need uh, that much uh, protection. I'm not talking about export subsidies uh, at all, because essentially they have gone, and they should remain gone. Great, thank you. Uh, let me, I'll, I'll come back to, is it, on, is it on immediate point, Seth, or sh can I come back to our, okay, let me come back to you after I, I um, pass the floor on to our, uh, our discussants, if you'd like to well, weigh I just in have, on that. I just have one uh, quick comment linking back to the energy markets, which is that I think coming back to transparency, we really need far greater transparency about what the regulatory systems are in energy um, in countries, as well as Sub energy subsidies and how they interact with the way agricultural markets are working. I'm not advocating that to be something that the WTO necessarily takes on. I know that there are NGOs that are working on those kinds of questions, but um, more information will help us understand the system better. Thank, thank you very much. Um, just two quick quest, two quick um, points. For the first one being. Um, uh, I think the WTO should continue working uh, with the OECD and others to uh, provide support uh, for uh, small economies in particular and LDCs to build up uh, supply side capacity um, so they can um, deal with some of those changes which would inevitably um, take place in, in so far as increased volatility. Um, the second one would be that um, uh, the disciplines on OTDS um, and also export restrictions and export competition, I think, can also assist in um, ensuring that the distortions which uh, can these these policies can create could be evened out. Um, and the third quick point is that um, it's perhaps is not for me to ask the question from here, but um, if oil prices continue its downward trend, given the fact that you have um, shale oil and uh, an abundance of other uh, uh, renewables, um, what would that do to the continued um, downward pressure being placed on agriculture prices? Um, is there a, uh, will, will agriculture prices continue to um, uh, be subdued if prices in the energy sector continue to trend downwards. Thank you, Seth. Do you want to come back in and uh, with a comment? Oh, just a per, perhaps a small comment, which is, I guess maybe if we, we talk about uh, price levels and what's normal, and and in just thinking about where price levels are today, I do think that there's a bit of a downward price risk, and I think one of the concerns is is that. These pr high prices have invited a bunch of production. What's the natural reaction in terms of, of country response when producers start to getting be, start to get squeezed in their margins, and they start to have problems with with uh, making production cash flow? I guess that's one concern. On the downside, is is what kind of response do you get? Not only here in the United States, around the world. How do you? What kind of response do you get? to tightening margins and 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 sure there's upside price risk and driven by some weather shock we can see ourselves back there uh, at higher prices obviously but we could also see ourselves having downward price pressure as we're building stocks and continuing to see a little bit of price pressure uh, on those commodities and again cost of production has risen to to meet those prices that we're at now we're at, at break even and I guess that's the other side of the concern is, is what do you see in response by governments to narrowing margins around the world? Good, thank you. Uh, and I think that's a, a response we may not be able to predict mm -hmm. easily, right? Uh, can I come back out to the floor, please? with any other questions or comments uh, and I would invite you on the floor also to uh, respond to the questions that were uh, put in front of us in the first round about volatility, about what the implications are for the WTO, uh, about a research agenda or an advocacy agenda, excuse me.
Can I just uh, respond, Stephen, to your question about uh, what would happen if we were to uh, see oil prices either remaining low or even decline more? Part of that answer, uh, part of the answer to that question, uh, Harry has given already. Uh, we have that link now under certain conditions between international oil prices uh, on the one hand and prices for agricultural commodities on the other hand. There is also another link uh, that Harry knows about but hasn't mentioned. He's talked about the biofuels link. There is a link through the cost of production uh, in agriculture and the cost of transport, of course, uh, agriculture uh, and uh, the whole distribution system uh, for food uh, tends to be relatively energy intensive, uh, fertilizer, tractors, uh, and so on, and so on. Uh, and therefore, there is uh, that cost of production link between uh, energy prices uh, more generally uh, and agricultural prices uh, as well. And through both the channels, the substitution uh, of agricultural commodities for fossil uh, energy sources, on the one hand, in the cost of production channel, uh, you have uh, that relatively close uh, relationship uh, between what happens on energy markets uh, and what happens on agricultural commodity markets. Uh, and depending on the particular conditions and the commodities uh, you look at, uh, it's uh, in the order of magnitude uh, of 10% uh, change uh, in the energy price gives you 2, 3, 4% change uh, in agricultural commodity prices. Uh, just as a sort of rough formula, uh, so, uh, you're right in assuming implicitly uh, that uh, should we uh, stay with uh, low energy prices or uh, see even lower prices, then uh, that would indeed affect uh, the uh, price situation on agricultural commodity markets. I have a question for uh Seth and Harry, I think we, we've used the United States as, a, as an example, and part of what Seth presented was uh, the, uh, if, I, if I got it right, Seth, uh, lowering of the, of the mandate for biofuels, and as you pointed out, uh, running up against the cost of production. Uh, and so there, there, there seem to be some trade-offs there. So one is a domestic question, which is, what, you know, what, what is likely to happen, especially if energy prices continue to fall uh, and, and there is reduced political support for such, uh, such programs, uh, what's, what's going to be the calculus? And I, I guess the other question is, as long as policies like this are in operation, what are the likely impacts um, for other countries who are pursuing biofuels policies? We focused on the U.S. Uh, so what, in, in terms of uh, not addressing this or in terms of the, the independent trajectories of countries um, using biofuels policies, are we in a space where, where we ought to be addressing the way uh, biofuels policies are used uh, or is there another sweet spot coming up? I don't know if that's, that's clear enough, but I'd be happy to hear from um, either of you on that. Harry, do you want to go ahead? Do you want to, or do you want me to take? Oh. Okay, I can't. I can't hear any of you. So perhaps Harry can go ahead. Okay, sorry, I'll go ahead because he can't hear me. Um, yeah, if if crude oil prices continue to fall, then um, as as Stefan emphasized, there's the demand side of the biofuel uh, uh, link to uh, energy prices affecting uh, commodity prices. Commodity prices will fall, as I explained, but also it'll, it'll reduce the uh, input costs to agriculture, which will relieve pressure, will reduce uh, uh, commodity prices as well. Uh, that only happens in the second state of nature. In the first state of nature, cost of production uh, doesn't matter. Uh, you asked about the decrease of, uh, of the mandate of biofuels in the United States. The same thing has happened more dramatically in the European Union. And even given that they started at 10%, went down to, well, they went down to five, then six, seven, now that's seven and a half. 
depends whether it's the U European Parliament, the European Commission, and the European Council or something or other. Um, so, but even then, they have not met their target. They have not met their mandate. Nobody's been forced to. So the European Union has been much more uh, scaling back than the United States has in terms of the mandate. The Brazil had scaled back on the mandate, but they've gone up to as about as high as they can given the system upon which they have a mandate. Now, remember, with this new year of biofuels, a shock in the sugar market now affects uh, the amount of paper traded on the corn pits in Chicago uh, Mercantile Exchange. Okay, they quit paper a few weeks ago, but you know what I'm saying. Um, so uh, it's a good question that mandates in Japan, in Canada, uh, what are their impacts? I don't know. Uh, I, however, one reason why the United States uh, originally put ethanol as uh, an environmental policy, as a regulation in the mandate, was to replace MTBE as a fuel additive, as carcinogenic. Uh, there are three billion gallons of MTBE used in the world right now, and if other countries follow, there's an extra three billion gallons of uh, ethanol market right there. So it's a good question. There's a lot of a lot of moving parts on this issue of uh, your question. It's a very good one, yeah. A lot of moving parts, which I can't answer, sorry. Okay. Seth, were you, you, were you able to get out? that? Okay. I, I guess, you know, from... We've had a fairly flat use of grain in the United States for ethanol for the last couple of years. I think the, the recent... If I interpret the recent announcement by EPA, it's a continuation of that very slow growth, just a little bit of pressure on expanding uh, our market outside of the traditional ethanol markets. So really just a little bit of pressure in trying to break out uh, ethanol use into higher level blends, but not enough pressure in order to create that market, make it large, and then subject that market to a lot of, of change shifts in demand from shifts in oil prices. I mean, when I look at this policy, uh, I tend to think, at least in the U.S., it locks us into a fairly, fairly, fairly narrow range of consumption, at least for the next couple of years. We also do a tremendous amount of export business in the United States, uh, or, or quite a bit, on the order of 800 to a, a 800 million gallons to a billion gallons, so somewhere in the neighborhood of three to four billion liters, um, and uh, you know. But that is going to places like Canada, which have a mandate, which markets are saturated. And then it goes to a lot of other mixed places, who uh, some countries who have their own policies, but you're also trying to expand that market in, into, in, a, in a point where oil prices are low and it makes those policies appear more expensive to those countries. And if their objective is to, in, for, uh, for internal support, maybe they prefer domestically produced product. So those are not the kind of markets where I see U.S. capacity growing in order to meet those markets. So I, I think you have to have oil break out of a range that we've seen recently for it to, to get back to that point where uh, the U.S. at least would be seeing production swing on the price of oil. I think in the short run, we're locked in a bit to what our policy suggests with some uh, – excess capacity being used uh, to service export markets. Good, thank you. So we're, uh, we're approaching our, uh, our five o'clock time, uh, the closing of the meeting. So I'd like to give an opportunity for any of you to ask or a question or comment from the floor uh, or from any of our panelists. Uh, any last words? I first look to the floor for a hand or comment. Oh, good. Okay, and then to our to our panel, please. Any of you uh, with last words or comments? Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. So, uh, with that, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us. I hope it was uh, insightful. Uh, I found it so uh, provocative. Even uh, it gives us um, some material to work with and understand how we can deal with, and, and particularly where we can deal with it. Uh, as you go out, please, uh, you should have a feedback form in your packet. Uh, if you would be so kind as to fill it out, take a moment to fill it out. Uh, that helps us understand um, whether we're meeting your needs, whether we're uh, 
uh, doing well in terms of how, uh, in terms of understanding these issues for you. So thank you very much, uh, and I look forward to seeing you again.